I think House of the Dragon just confirmed that Valyrians stole their fire magic. Kinda. The idea that we control the dragons is an illusion. They are power men should never have trifled with. One that brought Valyria its doom. Hello and welcome to the Company of the Cat, the channel where we talk about different stories from the A Song of Ice and Fire books and now House of the Dragon 2. And as you probably guessed, today's episode is about fire magic. The theft of fire for the benefit of humanity is a reoccurring theme in many world mythologies and this narrative is classified in the motif index of folk literature as a motif. Meaning, this myth is one of the oldest and is universal. All of these myths involve a figure as the thief and a supernatural guardian who is hoarding the source of fire from humans out of mistrust. And I think we have the same motif here, but instead of simple fire, we have the theft of fire magic. In all the prologues of the books, we have events and conversations that involve magic, in every single one of them. In the A Game of Thrones, Will is describing the cold. The real enemy is the cold, it steals up on you quieter than will, and at first you shiver and your teeth chatter, and you stamp your feet and dream of mulled wine at nice hot fire. It burns. It does. Nothing burns like the cold. After that, we see the others and the whites for the first time. The other halted. Will saw its eyes, blue, deeper and bluer than any human eyes, a blue that burned like ice. The magical others have burning eyes. Unlike any human, and when they use magic to reanimate the corpses, we see again burning eyes. A shard from his sword transfixed the blind white pupil of his left eye. The right eye was open, the pupil burned bright blue. It saw. In the first prologue, we are introduced to magic. We see the word burn to describe how peculiar and otherworldly their eyes are, how magical they are. This is a pattern we see in the next prologues as well. The word burn being used to describe something unusual, something magical. In the A Class of Kings, we see the red comet. And yet, and yet the comet burn even by day now. While pale grey steam rose from the hot vents of Dragonmont behind the castle, and yestermorn a white raven had brought word from the citadel itself. Word long expected, but no less fearful for all of that. Word of summer's end, omens, all. Too many to deny. What does it all mean? The comet is burning because obviously it's a comet and because it's red. But the comet symbolizes the beginning of the long night, the return of the dragons and the return of magic. And it burns long and bright. In the A Storm of Swords prologue we see them face the reality that the others are coming. Magic is real, magic is back and their job is to stand their ground and do their duties. There are thousands, someone said from behind said. We'll die. That was Maslin's voice, green with fear. Die, screamed Mormos Raven, flapping its black wings. Die, die, die. Many of us, the old bear said, mayhaps even all of us. But as another Lord Commander said a thousand years ago, this is why they dress us in black. Remember your words, brothers, for we are the swords in the darkness, the watchers on the walls. The fire that burns against the cold, Sir Malador Lock drew his longsword. The light that brings the dawn, others answered, and more swords were pulled from scabbards. They are the protectors of the realm of men from a magical enemy, a cold magical enemy, and nothing burns like the cold. But they did take an oath to be the fire that burns against that cold. Burn. Again. In A Feast for Crows, we have an even more eye-catching instance where magic burns. You saw some candle burning, I don't doubt, said Armen. A candle of black wax, perhaps. Armand crossed his arms. Obsidian does not burn. Dragon glass, Pate said. The small folk call it dragon glass. Somehow that seemed important. The magical glass candle was burning because magic has returned. It's very interesting how such powerful magic is in a candle in the first place. An object that burns, even though the material normally doesn't. In A Dance with Dragons, we have the description of Aramir's death. He is a magical person, a skin changer, and a very powerful one of that. He describes how death feels while he is skin changing, and why burning is the worst. His last death had been by fire. I burned. At first in his confusion he thought some archer on the wall had pierced him with a flaming arrow, but the fire had been inside him, consuming him. 
Varamir had died nine times before. He had died once from a spear thrust, one with a bear's teeth in his throat, and once in a wash of blood as he brought forth a stillborn cub. He died his first death when he was only six, as his father's axe crashed through his skull. Even that had not been so agonizing as the fire in his guts, crackling along his wings, devouring him. When he tried to fly from it, his terror found the flames and made them burn hotter. One moment he had been soaring above the wall, his eagle's eyes marking the movement of the men below. Then the flames had turned his heart into black and cinder, and sent his spirit screaming back into his own skin. And for a little while, he'd gone mad. He had died so many times, but burning was the one that made him mad. It was the one that couldn't live from. He had a hold on him, and it even felt worse when he tried to escape it. All this while his first death was when he was six. This looks like a pattern. Magic burns, and this is a theme throughout the books, not only in the prologues. The dire wolves have burning eyes, the unnatural green and red eyes of Ghost and Sagidog, that reminds us of green seers and the eyes of Summer, the dire wolf bonded with Bran, a real green seer. Now there was only Sagidog, rambling at a small man, his eyes burning like green fire. The dire wolf's eyes burn red as embers, as his teeth nip lightly at the soft skin of the boy's throat, just enough to draw blood. Summer stayed where he was, his eyes on Bran and the man beside him. He growled. His muzzle was wet and red, but his eyes burned. The eyes of magical people and creatures are always burn. The others have eyes like blue stars burning, or Melisandre's eyes that burn like pale red candle flames. When the crow tried to open Bran's third eye, the place burned. Burning and fire is an obvious connection, we see it all the time. Dragon's eggs, from the Saddlelands beyond the sigh, said Magister Illyrio. The eons have turned them to stone, yet still they burn bright with beauty. This is madness, she told herself, as she lifted the black and scarlet egg from the velvet. It will only crack and burn, and it's so beautiful. Yet we know that eggs, that the eggs burn with magic too, not only with beauty. The comet burning bright red is a sign, a strong one. The first star was a comet, burning red, blood red, fire red, the dragon's tail. She could not have asked for a stronger sign. The comet is not a common star, or just a simple comet. They could see the fire in the night, glimmering against the side of the mountain, like a fallen star. It burned redder than the other stars, and it did not twinkle. Fire magic burning is normal, but ice magic and greed magic also burn. Ice burns worse than fire, meaning ice magic is stronger than fire magic. Green magic is also burning and it can be pretty powerful magic, but it's way less used by humans in the series. We have Mel, Benero, Mokoro, Thoros perform fire magic all the time. People send kids, like Thoros, to learn fire magic. It's like a skill that you can learn and less blood-related ability like green searing and skin changing. Maybe having magical blood helps, but so far we have been told that several kids are sent there and they learn how to perform many spells. Last kiss included. I doubt all these people have magical blood, but they can do very impressive things, like resurrections. That leaves us with the only branch of magic I haven't talked about. Water. The Ironborn have the custom of the kiss of life. Right now it's CPR, but if we look closer, not only it is described very similar to the last kiss performed by the priests of Rolor, but Harvin and Thoros refer to the last kiss as the kiss of life. In the kiss of life, the Ironborn believe that you connect with the drowned god. They are drowning like their god died and was brought back to life stronger. Drowning burns. It burns your lungs, your eyes, and this is exactly what Theon felt. He felt like he was on fire and that the salt made his eyes burn. The burning sensation brings them closer to the watery holes of the drowned god. In Riveron they would tell you different. They say the Red Comet is a herald of the New Age, a messenger from the gods. A sign it is, the priest agreed, but from our god, not theirs. A burning brand it is, such as our people carried of old. It is the flame the drowned god brought from the sea, and it proclaims a rising tide. It is time to hoist our sails and go forth into the world with fire and sword, as he did. It was the great king who brought fire to the earth by taunting the storm god until he lashed down with a thunderbolt, setting a tree ablaze. First of all, fire and sword is very as high of him, but right now isn't what I want to talk about. 
The comet is a burning brand like the iron burn of old, a sign from the drowned god. In this quote, we see a theme that, as I said in the beginning, recurs in many real-life mythologies. The theft of fire for the benefit of humanity. In real-life mythologies, fire was exclusive to the gods. It was theirs and only theirs, until Prometheus and other similar figures stole the gift of fire from them and shared it with the humans. In this universe, though, we have another gift that burns. Magic. Grey King stealing fire from the storm god means he found a way to have the magic of the god. In the episode about Garth, I talked about the storm god and why he is the same power as Garth and the Weirwoods. The Grey King found a way to use the power of the trees to their benefit. The drowned god brought the magic from the depths of the sea. Ironborn, even though close to the sea, they burn and drown to their god. Let my uncle Aaron see to it. I'll give him six sips, all but foam drinker and sea bits, and he can burn and drown to his god surprise. They practice the kiss of life that is so close to the last kiss of Rolor, the god of fire. The drowned god may be a sea deity, but we are told that the drowned god had made them to rave and rape, to carve out kingdoms and write their names in fire and blood and song. Exactly like the Valyrians did. Fire in the novels and in real life is useful and helped humanity to evolve. The use and the making of fire is what made humans unique, but is also a means of destruction. We see ironborn ravings, the river lads burning for days because of war, Dothraki attacks with fire, the burning of the trees by humans. This is exactly why in all myths the god protector of fire didn't trust humans with it. If normal fire can do all this, imagine what humans can do with magic even more with fire magic. In the first episode of The House of the Dragon, Viserys said the idea that we control the dragons is an illusion, they are a power man should never have trifled with, one that brought Valyria its doom. In the same scene, Rhaenyra said that people think Valyrians are closer to God than men, but only because they have dragons, without them they are just like everybody else. In A Class of Kings, Quaith said They shall come day and night to see the wonder that has been born again into the world, and when they see, they shall last, for dragons are fire made flesh, and fire is power. Men aren't supposed to abuse this type of power. Yes, it can be useful, but is also dangerous, destructive and unpredictable. Fire magic was stolen like the fire was stolen in the myths around our world. This is why we see fire magic be connected mostly with humans in the books because humans found a way to have this type of power. Like the Ironborn, the Valyrians raved, raped and carved out kingdoms. They came into possession of dragons and magic because of fire, blood and song. The Doom of Valyria is the A Song of Ice and Fire equivalent of Atlantis. According to the myth, it was a civilization with great power, founded by semi-gods, but its people soon started getting greedy and believed they are the greatest in the world until the great city sank and disappeared from the face of the earth. So like the Atlanteans, maybe the Valyrians beat more than they could chew. Valyrians and fire magic users in general aren't closer to gods than men. They are men that found a way to have magic, powerful and dangerous magic, that in the end they couldn't control. Fire magic is a skill. Instead of offering blood to the gods, like the children of the forest and other people around Planetos, They use the blood themselves to create and gain power. We see from many priests of Rolor with sinking spells, fire and blood, many things are possible. Anyone can learn the secrets of the Red God. But blood is always necessary. Sacrifice is a key factor. The Velaryons, even though an old and strong Valyrian house, aren't associated with fire. They think of it as destructive and a prison. In episode 7, we see Vaemond perform the funerary rite for Lena. He acts as a priest, and the funeral is way different from Targaryen funerals. Salt curses through Valarian blood. Hours run thick, hours run true. And hours must never thin. May the winds be as strong as your back, your seas as calm as your spirits, and your nets as full as your heart. From the sea we came, to the sea we shall return. If the name Valarian wasn't in the quote, and someone asked me who said this, I would set some Ironborn character, not a Valyrian. When Vaemond was saying all this, Rhaenyra, Daemon and Viserys were looking at each other and at Vaemond, not exactly with distress, but they looked displeased. 
In the end of the episode, we see a very interesting conversation between Rhaenyra and Daemon. Everything that House Targaryen possess is owned to it, yet it has cost us both what we loved. Perhaps the Valarians knew the truth of it. The sea is the better ally. Fire is a prison. The sea offers an escape. Sacrifice. To have this kind of power, you need to give something you love. For the more you lose, the more you gain. Unlike Sea Snake, Vaemond cares for the House and Valarian bloodline only. Not the reputation and the names in history books. He described Corlys as a man whose ambition has brought down calamity after calamity. Vaemond was so riled up that the Driftwood throne wouldn't pass to a true Valarian that raised his voice against the king. You may run your house as you see fit, but you will not decide the future of mine. My house survived the doom and a thousand tribulations beside. We see a parallel here to Valyrians having trouble due to their ambition. We are also told that the magic the Valyrian mages used brought their own destruction. The dragon has three heads is something we hear all the time since book one, and at this point everyone has made a theory about this, so this is my contribution to the tinfoil. I actually agree with other people uh, quite a lot. And this is because, again, it's a pattern and not something specific. It applies to more than just specific people. This is why everyone has a different opinion on the matter and pretty much most of them fit. But it started from somewhere. And I think it started with fire magic and in extension the creation of the dragon bond. Dragons are fire made flesh, Valyrian's power source, the reason they are considered closer to gods than men. But their mages worked all forms of fire magic in the Fourteen Flames. The dragon has three heads, mean that you need three components to be able to have this kind of power. And I believe these are fire, blood, and song. In the golden past of the Ironborn, they were so powerful because of fire, blood, and song. There is even a book about their legends with the name Songs the Drowned Men Sing. The Red Priests of Rolor make their magic with fire, blood, and song, again, they sing their spells, they don't just say them. The magical children of the forest call themselves those who sing the song of the earth, in the true tongue. Their songs were said to sound as beautiful as they were and their voices are as pure as winter's air. Pat sings his very accurate prophecies after his drowning. In the prologue of A Game of Thrones, before their meeting with the others and the whites, Garrett and Weimar told Will that they were told as kids that dead men sing no songs. But after that, they died. They died because the dead were brought back with magic. We have different magical horns that make otherworldly sounds and allegedly grant you great power. Even the book series, and now we know Aegon's prophecy too, are called A Song of Ice and Fire. We also got Daemon's song to Vermithor, and by the way, whose idea was to make Matt Smith sing? That was a choice. I love him, but no. <laughs> we got, though, some very interesting information. Daemon, with a song, communicated with Vermithor. It wasn't to control the dragon, yes, but they did understand each other. He achieved whatever wanted to achieve. He locked eyes with him, and it seems like they understood each other. Two heads to a third sing, from my voice the fires have spoken, and the price have been paid, with blood magic, with words of fire, with clear eyes. To bind the three to you I sing, as one we gather, and with three heads we shall fly as we were destined, beautifully, freely. All forms of magic use blood, all of them, no blood, no magic. And apparently, in all of them you need songs and sounds. Singing is binding the three heads, but singing is one of the three components to have a dragon in the first place. Fire, blood and song are the first three heads, the OG three heads. Without them, you don't have magic. Humans weren't born with magic. Like in our world, humans in the beginning didn't know how to use or make fire. It was a skill. They found a way to harness that power and use it to their advantage. But also found ways to cause harm with that power. Fire is the only one of the four basic elements that we can make. We cannot create water, or earth, or air. We can learn how to use them, but we cannot create them. With the help of stones, wood, and air, we learn how to create fire. And with water and earth, again, we learn how to control it. This is why fire magic is used by humans so much. 
in the series when other types of magic aren't. People that are magical and connected to other aspects of magic were chosen and it's not something common. But fire mages learn that skill and that skill is why their dragon bonds exist. It doesn't look natural. Someone being a normal skin changer is genetic. Rare, but natural. A green seer has a short life on earth and isn't healthy. Pat and Aaron have the gift of prophecy, but they paid with their lives and sanity. Because as Blood Raven said, every song must have its balance. But in Damon's song, we saw that price have been paid with blood. And Mel does the same, blood sacrifices. You need blood and you can do whatever you want to do, doesn't matter how big your wish is. In Kohor, where some of the Valyrian spells have survived, like the reforging of Valyrian steel, they even sacrifice newborn babies and their children if needed. And they do blood sacrifices every day. Valyrians not only wanted to keep their powerful magic, but they wanted more. They became arrogant, greedy, did cruel things, and in the end, it beat them in the ass. Like in the myth of Atlantis. This is it for this week's video. Leave your own theories and thoughts about magic, dragons, and whatever else you want to talk about. If you stuck till the end, thank you very very much for watching. If you enjoyed it, press a like, subscribe to the channel, and tune in for the next upload, which is going to be about the Hightowers. Bye.